Continue your life. Good to see everybody that's logged on on Zoom and logged on on Facebook Live as well. Uh, we are delighted that you can join us on uh, another Saturday ministry meeting. Uh, we've got with us um, our brother Cameron Piper, and uh, so we're, we're glad to, to have him join us today. Um, we're just going to open with a word of prayer, and then we'll hand over to Cameron um, for his ministry. Father, again, we thank thee for thy goodness to us. We thank thee that we can gather together in this virtual way, even though it is not possible for us to be together in the physical sense. We thank thee, Father, for the importance of thy word and the importance that we are able to, to read it and to learn from it. Thy word tells us that the scriptures are to make us wise unto salvation. And we think, Father, of Timothy of how from a child he had known the holy scriptures and we realize father that to know what the scriptures would tell us is to have thy very self speaking to us we would just thank thee for being able to gather together and we just pray for Cameron and I would just help him and give him the the words that are upon his mind to, to say from thy word we just give thee our thanks now in the precious name of thy lovely son. Amen. Well, it's uh, it's good to be with you all. Um, I can only see a few faces, um, but uh, I'm sure there's others others listening. I might ask uh, if I if I can be a little bit cheeky. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of uh, Zoom meetings in one sense that you can't see who you're speaking to. So um, I, I understand that some people eat their dinner while, uh, while meetings are going on. But if if it was at all possible for folks to turn their cameras on, it does help help me out a lot to, to see who I'm speaking to. I, I just find that to be something with a few with a few meetings. Uh, if it's not possible, then uh, don't worry about it. But uh, I do find that it helps helps me through through these sorts of meetings. But anyway. I appreciate that, uh, and we will uh, look to God's word now to uh, see what he would have to say to us through it. Um, I've been studying recently the life of Joseph, uh, and I've really been enjoying looking at different aspects of the life of, life of Joseph. I have to confess that if, uh, if you had to put me on the spot and ask me what one of my favorite Bible stories is, uh, I would have to confess that it is the life of Joseph. Uh, I find that the way that the story weaves itself together uh, with the divine hand of God behind it all. I do find that the life of Joseph is an absolutely fascinating insight into the mind of God uh, and into this godly man, Joseph, and his dealings in a difficult situation. Uh, so we're going to turn to the word of God, and we're going to read from uh, Genesis and chapter 39. Genesis and chapter 39. I want to read, just pick out two expressions uh, from this chapter and then I'm going to go back through and we're going to read the whole chapter uh, together. The two expressions are found firstly in chapter 39 and verse 2. And it says this, and the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man and he was uh, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And the Lord was with Joseph in verse 2. Now verse 21 of chapter 39. Verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And so at the start of these two verses, we've got this, this little expression, and the Lord was with Joseph, but the Lord was with Joseph. And that's what I want to think about, uh, the Lord being with Joseph as he's challenged. He was challenged on his purity. He was challenged in the prison. Uh, and he was challenged with the preoccupation of the prisoners uh, with whom he was put over in the prison house. And so we're going to read this chapter. I'm sure it's well known by all, uh, but we're going to just take time to read the word of God. Uh, and Joseph, verse 1 of chapter 39, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, uh, uh, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian brought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph. And he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, 
and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not aught that he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favoured. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. And she said, lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is in me, with me in the house, or he, he doesn't really know what's with me uh, in the house, uh, and he hath committed all that he hath into my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about the time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. And it came to pass, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled, uh, fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought an Egyptian unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me. And I cried with a loud voice, and it came to pass, when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. And she spake unto him the according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought in unto us came unto me to mock me. And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass, when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favour in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. And the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. And we trust that the Lord will bless uh, the reading of his word. As you would come through the book of Genesis, uh, the very seed plot of the Bible, uh, you would find in the beginning God, uh, and then as you would come through from that triune God in the creation of the world uh, and the Savior himself, really, the Lord Jesus Christ, as you'd come to chapters like John's gospel uh, and verse three would tell you, tell us that all things were made by him uh, and nothing was made uh, and without him was not, not anything made that was made. And you would find the Lord Jesus there in creation. You'd find him there in Hebrews chapter one. You'd find him there in Colossians chapter one as well, that he uh, hath uh, created all things, that he was there. He And the, the savior was instrumental in the creation of the world. But as you come through the seed plot of the Bible, as you come through the, the book of Genesis, you'll find occasions where the Lord shows to us uh, something that would prefigure Christ or that would show us the Lord Jesus Christ in type form. Uh, you could think of uh, a mountain like Moriah. You could think of Genesis chapter 22 and a father and a son. And they go up a mountain. Uh, they go up to that mountain that was shown them uh, aforetime. And that they went up and they, uh, as they journeyed towards the hill and they were looking up. And ultimately that, that mountain loomed large in their anticipation as they walked towards the place of sacrifice. And then came the time when the, the, the servants were left, the, the men were left. And the father and the son alone, they walked up the mountain and they were there uh, and the place of sacrifice came into view. And that you, you see in picture Calvary, you see in picture Calvary as the father and the son alone go into the darkness and deal with sin. And as you would come through from Abraham and you can find with Isaac, you can find the, the beautiful picture of the bride that's been delivered to him and he meets her in the desert way. 
uh, and you would find a lovely pictures. And as you come now into, into Jacob's experience uh, and the man who's dependent now on God, walking with a limp, he was cunning and, and crafty himself. But as you come through these patriarchs, you now come to Joseph. And again, God gives us this picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Very interesting. I don't know whether there's some of these young barber boys that are listening to this. Perhaps they are behind the screen. But as you read the scriptures or as your mum and dad read you the scriptures, as we go through the Bible, it's important for us to to look for Christ in all the scriptures. You would remember those two on the road to Emmaus uh, as they walked and they were downcast uh, and the Lord Jesus would come near himself and he would explain to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And it's a wonderful thing to find Christ in all the scriptures. So we come to the story of Joseph. And, uh, and Joseph is a, is, a, is a man who is a picture for us of the Lord Jesus Christ. Interesting to notice that all the way through uh, the scriptures, the Bible very accurately records for us the, the men that it records for us. It records for us regardless of their good and their bad. Uh, the good points and their bad points. It tells us that men are of great caliber and it tells us that they sometimes sinned. And yet very interesting to notice that in Joseph's life, we don't read of any known sin. Of course, he was a sinner. He was, uh, he was not immune from sin. And yet in this account, as we would read it through Genesis, no sin recorded for us. It was interesting that he's willing to go. Uh, as he in previous chapters, he explains to his father, says, I, I want to send you. I want to send you to go and look at your brothers and to, to take things for them. And he says, here am I. I will go. I will go. He was willing to go. He was pure uh, and he was prosperous. He was industrious. Uh, and all these things that characterize the life of Joseph, do they not remind us of the Savior himself, that he was willing to go? When somebody was asked in heaven, uh, you can re read in Isaiah, uh, although it maybe refers more to Isaiah, but I think perhaps there's a prophetic aspect to it. Uh, who will go for us? Here am I. Send me. And the Savior comes into the world, born of a woman, made under the law, that he might redeem them uh, under the law. He was pure. He was harmless. He was separate from sinners, the Savior himself, just like just like. Uh, just like Joseph. He also was industrious, wasn't he? He didn't come just to uh, walk around and to look at the things that he had made and the creation. And he came to do a job. He came to do the will of his father, the work that his father had given him to do. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And he was willing to come. The Hebrew writer would tell us of that insight to a conversation. Lo, I come. In the role of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O oh my God. In the garden, not my will, but thine be done. And so here we see uh, a, a Joseph uh, as a picture of the Lord Jesus, who is willing to do all these things. And yet I want to think about this man, Joseph, and I want to think about three challenges that he faced. Three challenges that he faced. Joseph was challenged on his purity. He was challenged in the prison and he was challenged on the preoccupation of those in the prison house. Uh, just, Andrew, what time am I uh, to, to finish? I know you're on mute there, but am I to finish at quarter two or on the hour? Just whenever you whenever. feel is fine with us. That's fine. So Joseph uh, faced these great challenges uh, to his character uh, and to his uh, to his person, really, uh, and to the man that he would eventually become. He was challenged on his purity. Uh, he was challenged as he would come into this place. You would think of him, this, this boy of 17 years old, and he sold into the hands of the Ishmaelites. He, he was taken by uh, nine or ten of his uh, brethren, and put and thrust into a pit where there was no water at the bottom. He couldn't scale the sides, and he was taken out and sold to these Ishmaelites. The little conversation that they have later on, uh, and the brothers uh, later on in Egypt, 
they say that they are get verily guilty concerning their brother Joseph uh, when they sat down to eat bread and they could hear the, the cries and the screams of this boy as he was taken uh, away by these Ishmaelites, as he was taken out of the pit and sold into captivity. Uh, and you can imagine the heartbreak of this boy who leaves the father's house and goes and sees his, his brothers. Uh, and yet he would never return to see his father's face. He would never go back to his home. I don't know that he, he goes back uh, later, many years later, but he doesn't go back for many, many years. And he doesn't see his father for possibly 25 or so years. But he was challenged as he came into this house, as he comes now up out of the pit, now into the, into the uh, slave market where he would have been examined and bought just like a piece of farm machinery or, or a, in the same way that we would treat a dishwasher, uh, you'd inspect it to make sure you, that you were getting a good one. Well, he would have been inspected and Potiphar, uh, he buys Joseph and takes him into his house. And as he goes there, Potiphar, the captain of the guard, this man who is very responsible uh, in the military scene, uh, he is a, a man of great power, of great might. Uh, he's uh, probably a very large man, a very muscular man. And uh, no doubt he had a very beautiful wife. Uh, the man of great power with great money, uh, obviously, he had a, a, a bit about him in terms of his material possessions because he had lots of things in the field and in the house in, in which to entrust to Joseph. And this man with money and might would have no doubt have had the pick of the bunch, we might say, and likely had a very beautiful wife. And so it was that this woman cast her eyes upon Joseph and presents to him his first challenge on his purity. I want to just say this very clearly uh, at the outset, that purity is still a challenge today. Purity is still a challenge in the 21st century, in 2020, as it was all these years ago with Joseph. The purity of a man and a woman of God as they seek to live before God is still a challenge. And there is all sorts of trip-ups and hazards uh, to be presented before the child of God as we walk this way here on earth that would seek to snag us uh, and to challenge us on our purity just in the same way that Joseph was challenged on his. There's a little uh, chorus. I don't think we ever sang it at Sunday school, but I remember it being on tapes in the car. And uh, as a little boy, I, I can remember thinking that it was quite a, quite a childish little song uh, quite a childish little chorus and yet as i've grown older uh, i realize that there's great truth in it and it goes like this it goes be careful little eyes what you see and it says it three times be careful little eyes what you see oh be careful little eyes what you see for a father up above is looking down in love oh be careful little eyes what you see and you know there's still things that your eyes and mine can see out in the world that will defile us for the service of God. There are things that we can see even in our own home. Uh, there are things uh, that are so easily accessible that just a few clicks of a button will bring a world of iniquity before our eyes and it will defile us in much the same way in our mind as Joseph was, could have been defiled if he had fallen to temptation. I want to be very clear that temptation to sin is still very real and it's very strong and the heart of man hasn't changed in all these thousands of years since Joseph's time and we need to guard our integrity as men and women of God in much the same way as he did. He left his garment. He would not do this great wickedness and sin in the sight of God. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And ultimately, friend, all sin is against God and he uh, walked in a way that was pure and pleasing to God. And men and women of God that walk in pure paths are still pleasing to God. In the same way that the Savior walked in a pure path, he was pure and undefiled. He was separate from sinners. There was no taint of sin that ever touched his holy life. And he was a man that pleased God. Behold my, uh, uh, sorry, uh, at the banks of the Jordan River, 
it could be declared that he uh, was all his delight, the father for the son. Uh, purity pleases God, and it still pleases God. God was with Joseph because he was pure. He remained pure. And that was one of the reasons, I think, that the Lord was with Joseph, because he remained pure. You will remember uh, that <coughs> it's important for us as children of God to walk in the light. It's important for us to walk in the light as he is in the light. John's epistle tells us that we need to walk with him in the light. Then our, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. If we walk with him in the light, let me just turn that up so I don't misquote it. I wouldn't do to misquote the word of God now. So uh, John chapter uh, 1, the epistle of John in chapter 1 and verse 6 says this, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And so it is true that if we sin, that we do have an advocate with the father. This epistle would tell us that we have an advocate. And the, the reason that we would go to the advocate for the cleansing, that blood which cleanses us from all sin, is to bring us back into the light, to bring us back into a close walk with God himself. You'll notice that as Joseph puts up the, the stoppers, if you will, as he put up, puts up the obstacles, I cannot sin against God. The challenge to his purity comes and he says, no, I will remain pure. I will walk with God. I will walk in the light. You will notice that the sin becomes easier to do. The sin that initially she said lie with me in verse 10 of chapter 39 of Genesis tells us that the sin, the boundary and the barrier and the bar to cross becomes lower for him. Not now is it lie with me, but now it is um, just to lie by her. Uh, and then when he refuses to just lie by her, uh, just be with me, she says, just to be with her, just to spend some time. Is there anything wrong with spending time like that? My friend, we need to be very, very careful in how we spend our time uh, when our purity is in question, when, our challenge, when we are being challenged on our integrity and our purity. So Joseph was challenged on his purity uh, and he succeeded and he, and he excelled that test and that trial that was put before him. And he, though it cost him, a garment would have been a costly uh, investment back in those days. It would have been something... Uh, that would have been va very valuable, and yet he left something of his in her hand that he might keep his integrity in his hand. Well. I think that Potiphar knew the way in which his wife was. I personally don't think that in this time that we're talking about that uh, human rights weren't really a thing, especially not for slaves, especially not for foreigners that were brought in and sold as property. It would have been nothing for this man of military might to have just taken Joseph round the back and done away with him uh, and to buried him somewhere that nobody would have known uh, and nobody would have said anything uh, about it. Uh, I don't think that it would have taken two seconds for this man to end Joseph's life if Potiphar genuinely thought that this sin had taken place as his wife had had accused him and so I think his wrath that is spoken of potentially isn't in the belief that this accusation is true but I think it's in the realization that he will have to send him to prison and this prosperous man that is bringing good and the blessing of God by everything that he does into the house of this man Potiphar he is now going to have to part with this man and I think that he's angry at his wife uh, his wrath uh, was kindled and so he takes him down to this prison house and Joseph then finds himself challenged in the prison how does Joseph find himself challenged in the prison well you think about it this way this boy Joseph who, who is now maybe a couple of years uh, away from his father it's now been a couple of years perhaps that he's been in Potiphar's house I don't know how long he spent there uh, but this boy that was used to roaming the fields, 
and walking up and down the lush valleys uh, where the sheep fed. This uh, pampered shepherd boy, we might say, uh, pampered with his father's love and maybe a little bit full of himself as he had had these dreams of grandeur of the sun and the moon and the stars bowing down to him. The seven she, the, uh, sorry, the, um, the 12 sheaves, 11 sheaves bowing down to him uh, in, the, in the field. Uh, and he has these visions of grandeur about himself and he wanders around in this coat of many colors. Really, when you look into that coat of many colors, you find that uh, it also has the idea of a garment of full length, a garment of full length. And that's significant because a garment that would come down to the sleeves around the, the wrist and around the ankles uh, would have indicated somebody that wasn't particularly hardworking in their job. These shepherd boys, uh, Joseph's brothers, they wouldn't have had garments of full length that came down to their wrists and down to their ankles. They would have had uh, garments that maybe came down to the knee and maybe came down to the elbow. Why? Because as they deal with the sheep, as they go through the undergrowth and the brush and the, and the uh, scrub, they don't want the thistles and the thorns to grab hold of their arms and, the, and a hardworking man's robe would have maybe come to the knee and maybe come down to the elbow. But this man, this boy Joseph, in his garment of many colours, lovely in its, in its as to look at, but it's also a garment of full length indicating to us that he po probably didn't have to do the most arduous of tasks. He probably had quite an easy life in the father's house, we might say. And so this boy, who is possibly a little bit soft, a little bit full of himself, a little bit proud perhaps of, of uh, <coughs> the position in his father's affections and the, uh, the future that he has, he comes... And he is now taken roughly by men and cast into this prison, once into the pit, then into chains uh, to follow a camel, uh, ca uh, a camel train down into Egypt. And uh, he's locked up. And uh, as you would read later on, and he says that there's no reason for him to be taken as he speaks to the uh, to the chief butler. He says, I was taken away. Uh, where does it say? Uh, in verse 15 of, of chapter 40, it says, For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here I have done nothing that they should put me into this dungeon. And really the word there is this hole, this pit, a hole, a dark hole. I've just uh, finished reading a book by a man uh, called Harolan Popov, uh, and he was a communist prisoner in communist Bulgaria uh, back at the start of the 1900s uh, and the conditions that he was kept were absolutely horrifying and I imagine that the conditions in which Joseph was kept in this dark dungeon where the toilets likely were just a bucket in the corner where there were men in and I've just looked before I came online to speak about the the heat of, of Egypt our very hot country uh, sometimes the the temperatures can reach temperatures of 40 and sometimes 50 degrees centigrade and unwashed unbathed men with toilets and buckets in the in the in the pit and this dungeon and the rats and the disease and the unsanitary conditions that Joseph would have experienced in this hole in this dungeon not like the prisons that we have in England with TVs and Mat nice cushy mattresses and, and regular showers. No, no. This was a challenge to Joseph as he's been stolen away from a place where he experienced great freedom to a place where he experienced great confinement. Locked up in the hole, locked up in this hot, dark cell. And uh, the Psalms tell us in Psalm 105 it tells us that the, the iron, the fetters hurt his feet. And it tells us that the iron entered his soul. The iron entered his soul. And that psalm that tells us about the patriarchs, that tells us about the great men of God of the past. And it tells us that this is what happened to Joseph. Now a lifetime of confinement and, and, and pain and suffering. The iron entered his soul. Now one way to read that, I suppose, is that the iron caused him great suffering. 
another way to read it, I suppose, is that the iron entered his soul, that there was something in his spirit, something in his person that became hardened and toughened at the experience for which he was put in. And I wonder whether the, the way in which Joseph was now in the prison was God teaching him that he needed to be tougher in order to rule the, the leading empire of the day. A soft, soft boy would not be able to rule and lead an empire in the same way that Joseph ruled Egypt as he was second in command, prime minister of all Egypt. This great uh, superpower of the day, the equivalent of a, of a boy rising to be president of the United States or, uh, or a country like it. And he needed to be toughened. He needed something of an iron character. He needed something to uh, harden him up. And perhaps it was that this was God's way. Perhaps it is, dear saint, that we need to be toughened up. Perhaps it is, dear saint, that we need to be tougher spiritually. Maybe it is that we have in, in our ideas and in our mentality this idea that we deserve to have a nice, easy life and a nice and easygoing Western way where every comfort is afforded to us. And perhaps we don't suffer as we ought to suffer. You know, when you would read the New Testament epistles, Peter would say to those saints of old, he would say this. He would, <clears throat> let me just pull it up. I had it, I had it up earlier. He would say to those saints of old, he would say, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Don't think it's strange when you suffer. Perhaps we don't suffer very much, especially when you read of countries like communist Bulgaria, as it was. Think of countries that are still in communist rule, like North Korea, like China, like Cuba. All these countries where to be a Christian brings a great price. Think of Muslim countries where just the owning of a Bible will gain you a hundred lashes or even execution. Think of the suffering for Christ's sake that we know very little and nothing of. And perhaps it is, dear saint, that we would look on a world that is darkening by the day, that it might not be too long before we are made to be tougher spiritually. Maybe the iron will enter our soul. Maybe there will be saints of God in assemblies of God up and down the UK that might find themselves in the next decade in prison, incarcerated because they are a Christian and because we take the stand that we take on morality and on, uh, on the word of God that we do. Perhaps it is that we will be caused to toughen up spiritually. So Joseph was challenged, wasn't he? He was challenged in prison. You know, God uses suffering in a variety of ways. There are many, many saints of God that have suffered. There are many saints of God that suffer in this country with their health. There are many saints of God that suffer financially, suffer in all kinds of ways, in family situations that are difficult and beyond their control. And God uses suffering to toughen us up and to make us stronger, that we might uh, be useful for him and that we might not be soft. Uh, that we might be useful for him. You think of that expression in the, in the scriptures that talks about that no soldier entangleth himself in the affairs of this world. Well, soldiers, it's a sorry thing to find a, a soft soldier, isn't it? It's a sad thing to find a soldier that's scared and, and afraid of, of, of hardship. And we ought to be tough. Uh, and to gain that toughness in our souls as a result of the things that God puts us through as change, uh, as, as uh, to change our characters, that we might be useful for him. As we suffer, God lets us suffer in many different ways, but we need to suffer like Joseph. He could have appealed. He could have shouted from the prison bars day in and day out about his innocence, but he realized that God was using him and training him in the prison house do you know he was challenged in the prison but god showed him something wonderful you will remember that mountaintop of old experience of moses as he says to god show me 
thy glory. And God puts Moses in the rock and covers him with his hand. And he gets this glimpse of God's glory just passing by as the hinder parts of God are shown to, to Moses there in the mount in the rock. If God's glory was shown to Moses, then I think that God showed, or indeed it tells us, that God shows us something of his character to Joseph in the prison house. What does God show to Joseph in verse 21? The Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. He showed him mercy. And so there was something of the very character of God that was demonstrated to Joseph in the prison house there. And there is something that is shown of the character of God, no doubt, dear saint, to each one of us that go through dark trials and dark and difficult times. He shows us something of his character. And that is worth the suffering. It was well worth Joseph's going to prison that he might see something of God's mercy. And so Joseph was challenged in his purity. He was challenged in the prison and he was challenged with the preoccupation of others. He was challenged as he looked on others that came across his pathway. Everything that was done in the prison house, Joseph was the doer of it. He was the doer of it. He had an intimate relate. He had a intimate knowledge of uh, all the prisoners. He knew uh, the the reasons that they were there. He knew who they were. Uh, somebody has suggested that one of the reasons that Joseph, who was just a foreign slave boy, was cast into the prison house, uh, he was uh, taken and he was put in a prison in verse twenty, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And this boy who had roamed the fields knew likely very little of politics, knew very little of how to rule a country. And yet the chief butler and the chief baker, they might seem very little titles to us, but these were very large people. These were very important people. And they no doubt would have discussed the politics of the land with Joseph. And so he learned something uh, of, his, of the way in which he needs to learn something of the place that he will be. Uh, as he passes them by, as he passes by these prisoners, he, he passes by and he says to them in chapter 40, verse 7, he says, why do you look so sadly today? Why do you look so sadly today? A man who is in a miserable condition himself, who, who is hurt by the iron, who, who is in a bad situation himself, who, well, he could have been preoccupied with, there's no reason that I should be here. I'm an innocent man. And you see here that there's nothing of protest. There's nothing of protest about Joseph, just in the same way that the Lord Jesus himself, Pilate marvels at the Savior. As he say, do you not see all these things that they witness against you? Are, are you not going to say anything uh, against these witnesses? And he said nothing in so much that Pilate marveled. And Joseph here, look at what he does as he deals with the men of the prison. He doesn't dwell on his own sadness and his own situation, but he seeks to help them in theirs. He seeks to help them in their situation. My friend, if you find yourself, and perhaps it is that I'll be challenged on this, uh, and I trust that God will give me grace too, if it is so, but possibly when we suffer, very easy to look inward very easy to look and to become self-absorbed in our own situation and our own circumstance. But that's not what Joseph did. Oh, no, what Joseph did was he looked at men that were more miserable than he. And he says, why are you so sad, looking so sadly today? And they say to him, well, we've dreamed a dream. And that is what is causing them the great sadness there. Very interesting, those dreams, as you would look at them. These two men, I always thought when I was a young boy and I heard the story of Joseph, I thought, very unfair. Why is one man promoted and put back in his position as chief butler? And the baker, why does he suffer uh, death in three days uh, from, the, from the time that he dreams the dream? Why is it that one man lives and one man dies? Well, as you look into Egyptian culture, uh, as you would look into the way in which uh, the, the, the dreams play out, you will see that the butler was very selfless and the baker was very selfish 
the butler, he, as you go through, and it's not really the portion that I've had in mind, but it is something that I've enjoyed in time past. But as you would read the dream of the butler, uh, as he speaks to Joseph, he says, there were three branches. The vine had three branches and it budded and it blossomed and it shot forth and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was before my was in my hand. And I took the grapes and I pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. What does he have before him? He has something living. He has something, the fruit of the vine. He has something that would bring joy. And he takes it. And his preoccupation is that he would have something to give to the king, that he would have something to take from the vine, something of life and something of joy, and that he would be able to give it into Pharaoh's hand. He had Pharaoh's cup before him. And so he wasn't focused on himself. When you come to the butler, or to the baker rather, he doesn't take something that's living like the grapes that are on the vine. He takes something that is dead. He takes the flour and the wheat, something that has been taken and threshed and is a dead product. And he takes it and listen to him. Uh, he says, I had three white baskets on my head and the uppermost basket, there was all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh and the birds did eat them of the basket off my head. And so he's focused in on himself. He's taken not something of life and joy, but he's now taken something dry and dusty and dead like flour and grain. And he's, he's made it himself. You see, when you take something of the, the, the vine, uh, I was, uh, there's a, a man just next to where we live and he actually makes wine. And I was speaking to him a little while ago uh, and I was uh, chatting to him about what he does. And, and he says, really, uh, the, the grapes that I select, they really have the biggest influence on the finished product. He says, the wine only tastes as good as the grapes that I put into it. And so there was no control really over, the, over the, the quality of the grapes because it grows itself. And yet this man, the, the baker, he takes things that are dead and dry and dusty and he puts it together and the baker's skill is called in. And he says, I put it on my head. I put three baskets on and I put the, the baked meats right at the top. And as you would look at Egyptian culture, it was the women that would carry things through the streets on their head. It was the women. Uh, so this man who has taken something himself, he is called into question his own skill as a baker. He's taken something that's dead and dusty and dry, and he's put it on show, and he walks like a lady through the streets of, of Egypt as he takes it uh, to uh, the king. And so that's the reason, uh, just as a little aside there, of the reason of those dreams. But he, Joseph, as he's challenged on what these men are focused on, he goes in and he talks to them about uh, their sadness. And he's challenged on their preoccupation. You know, he, he's worried about them. He's worried about their sadnesses and their sorrows. And he takes time to sit with them and to listen about the dreams that are troubling them. You know, I, I've uh, come across a little book by F.B. Myers, uh, and he says this, he says, there's no anodyne for heart sorrow like ministry to others. If your life is woven with the dark shades of sorrow, he puts it far better than I could. His grip on English is great, uh, this man. If your life is woven with the dark shades of sorrow, do not sit down to deplore in solitude your hapless lot, but arise to seek those who are more miserable than you are bearing them balm for their wounds and love for their heartbreaks. And if you are unable to give much practical help, you need not abandon yourself to the gratification of lonely sorrow, for you may largely help the children of bitterness by imitating Joseph and listening to their tales of woe or their dreams of foreboding. You know, this is saying this, that Joseph focused, he focused on others, even though he was suffering himself. And I wonder when we suffer, do we sit down to look at ourselves and look inward or do we look outward? And rather than focusing on ourselves and our own suffering, we take aid, uh, whether that's prayer support, whether it's practical help, whether we do we take that to others and to help them in their lot. And so as we come to an end, really, of the things that I have to say, that Joseph here, that man who is a picture of Christ, who who triumphed and rose to, to such a, a height of exaltation so that he was second in the land. 
Uh, although he's a picture of Christ, he's he's not the complete picture. You'll understand, because Christ was never is never second in command. He is going to be exalted. He 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 is exalted to the right hand of God, and he is in that place of exaltation on honor. The Isaiah, would, the book of Isaiah, would tell us this. Behold, my uh, my. Sorry, it's just gone from my mind. Let me just turn it up. Isaiah chapter. 50. Oh, I'll just maybe it's not 50. Sorry, 52. Behold, my servant shall deal prud prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And that is the place of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, uh, right now. He's exalted to the right hand of the very Father uh, in heaven. And he has been exalted and extolled and is made very high. Why? He went low, just like Joseph. Just like Joseph went down and down, down from the Father's house to see his brethren. And down into the pit and down into the prison house. And then his steps were upward to exaltation. You know, I wonder what that must have been for the Savior to hear the words of Peter that day as he started to explain to him how the Son of Man must be delivered and must suffer many things. And Peter would say, not so. Not so, Lord. You won't suffer. You don't need to suffer before you are before glory. You don't need to experience the cross. Not so. And the Savior himself says this, get thee behind me, Satan. For thou, thou savorest not the things that be of God, but be of men. Isn't it of men? Isn't it the, the ideas and our ideals of men that we should avoid suffering? That we should, that we should skirt it, that we should give it a wide berth and at all costs that we should be happy? Whereas God sometimes brings men into low situations that they might learn something of him and of service for him and that they might be useful in his hand and be exalted to, uh, to usefulness for him. Perhaps it is that there are those that are listening to this and you've experienced very dark and deep situations and suffering and there doesn't seem to have been any ex uh, opportunity for service in this life. You feel that the iron has entered your soul and you've been changed by your circumstance and situation. But you haven't had the opportunity now and the years are advancing. And perhaps you feel that all this suffering that has fitted you for useful service for God will all go to waste. My dear friend, there is service to come for the child of God. Something that I've not heard very much ministry on is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the earth? Do you not know that the saints shall judge angels? that there is a service beyond the sky, and perhaps it is, but it's pointing us. The suffering and the training ground of 70, 80, or 90-odd years on earth is putting us in, a, in an experience that will make us useful for service in God's courts one day. May we just take heart. May we take heart that whatever we're going through, that there is a way to overcome it, whether we're challenged with purity or challenged in a prison situation, or, or the depth of, of, of Joseph's experience in the prison house, that this suffering that we experience, to not look inwardly, but to look outwardly to others, and to look at Christ and the right hand of God, and to, um, uh, to look to him uh, as the reason and the hope, source of our hope through this world. We trust that God will bless the, the reading of his word, and those things that are from himself, as they've been explained to us, we just pray that God will bless his word tonight to each one uh, that's been listening uh, this evening. May God bless his word. Will I close with a word of prayer, Andrew, and then pass over to you? Yep, that's fine. Father, we bow in thy presence now and we give thee our grateful thanks for thy word. And Father, we thank thee that there's nothing uh, as uh, great a treasure on planet Earth as thy word. And Father, we thank thee that it's like gold that has been tried in the fire. Uh, and our Father, it's pure, and every page is good. And there's great instruction for us uh, of 
how we ought to live in this world. And our Father, we just pray that we would uh, glean things from thy word as we would look at men of God who lived from thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way, uh, but by taking heed according to thy word. Our Father, we pray that we would have clean hands and clean hearts as we would seek to serve thee in this life. And our Father, we pray that as we would go into dark suffering, our Father, we would think of how Peter would tell us of the fiery trial that is to come, that we shouldn't think of it as some strange thing that would come upon us. Our Father, that it is the way uh, that saints of old have gone. We would think of that great chapter of faith uh, in Hebrews 11, and some were tortured and torn asunder, that walk, walked about naked and destitute, uh, that abode in caves of the earth, and that they were uh, they suffered all these things of whom the world was not worthy. And our Father, we thank thee for the great price that thou dost put on thy people uh, and the sufferings that they experience is not unseen by thyself. Our Father, we pray that we would use and take any suffering that we experience as those uh, experience that would fit us for thy service. And our Father, we just pray that thou would help us to learn the lessons of life that we need to learn. Our Father, we thank thee for a great and a glorious prospect for the believer that we will be with thee eternally and we will serve thee and worship thee uh, for the ages and the, uh, and the eons to come. Our Father, we just would commit our time to thee now and give thee thanks for thy word and for this example of this man called Joseph. And our Father, we just pray uh, that these things would not just go into our ears, but would go down into our hearts, that we wouldn't just be hearers of thy word, but that we would be doers also. So as we've looked at these challenges, our Father, we pray that they would be useful for us and practical in everyday life. And that <laughs> we'd all be able to say as a result of listening to thy word this evening that it was good uh, for us to be here. Our Father, we thank thee. We look to thee to bless us as we part now. We think of the difficulties of the circumstances that we find ourselves in as a nation. We pray for those that would lead our nation uh, as we've been instructed to pray for kings and for rulers and for all those in authority that we might lead a quiet and peaceable uh, life our father we pray that thou would uh, re restore to us the joy of meeting together to break uh, the bread and to share a cup our father we ask that thou would help us uh, in these days of difficulty and restriction and that thy people might be encouraged as a result of thy word so our father we commit our evening to thee now in thy son's worthy and precious name lord jesus christ amen, amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Cameron, um, for your message um, tonight. It's greatly appreciated. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight um, on the Facebook and on the Zoom. Uh, just a reminder that we've got further two meetings planned on Saturday, the 5th of December, 2020, God willing, and we expect you, Reese from Carmarthen to be with us and on Saturday the 30th of January 2021 we are expecting Stephen Baker from Liverpool. All these meetings are at 7pm and in the will of the Lord. Thank you for joining us.